Hi everybody! Welcome to week five of the game and narrative class. We have finally reached kind of the interesting origin point of this course, at least for me, uh, which is to say it's actual play week, or at least the first of the actual play weeks. Uh, as we know, students are going to get the chance to decide what the structure of the weeks after this one are going to be. So we could have a lot more actual play. We could be play testing stuff. We could be reading de dense theory. That's pretty unlikely. This week is also unofficially the week of Abria Iyengar. It's a good time to celebrate the dungeon mastering and game mastering work Abria has done over the summer the summer that we've been calling the Summer of Abria. She's been everywhere. And in fact, when I was assembling a supplemental list of the games that she'd participated in or led over the last little while that are available on YouTube, it got big real fast. Um, I decided uh, to have students kind of dive into actual play through first Misfits and Magic. Um, the first episode is available on YouTube, although everything else is behind the Dropbox.tv paywall. And uh, I thought it was useful since we are still the Harry Potter generations to think about an actual play that is itself involved with media ecologies beyond just the role-playing world, but is in fact thinking very dynamically about what do we do with the world of Harry Potter in a time when the creator of Harry Potter is a controversial figure to say the least. It was a good place to start also because we started with William White's piece from Analog Game uh, Studies, Actual Play and the Laws of the Media, which is a uh, focus on thinking about media ecologies and other concepts from media studies and how they apply to the transformation of our understanding of role-playing games in the time of actual play and internet fandom. It's really particularly interesting to be talking about a scholarly article that invokes Marshall McLuhan's famous, The Medium is the Message, on the morning after AOC famously defended her Tax the Rich statement dress at the Met Gala last night with simply saying the medium is the message. And we actually started there um, thinking about, well, what is the medium and what is the message of AOC's Met, uh, Met Ball Gala dress? And the answer, of course, as our brilliant class very quickly noted is not just the medium of the dress itself, but the entire uh, nature of the performance, right? The the person who is in the dress matters. The situation of the making of the dress, who made it and how, as well as the context in which the dress was displayed. Arguably one of the most famous charity galas in the world. One that for many of those in attendance cost an enormous amount. It is a place for the display of wealth and power. Up, regardless of what you think about the nature of the statement, the rhetorical effectiveness is pretty high. A lot of people were talking about it this morning, and if the goal is to get that phrase in front of as many people as possible, it was pretty effective. Why start with that? Well, because it's a good place as a microcosm to talk about media ecologies. Media ecologies are um, the situatedness of works that we experience. And it's more important than ever, but as I argued, as an 18th centuryist and as a cultural literary historian, it's always important for me to think about texts and works of art in the context of their initial making and their afterlives thereafter, because of course, works kind of stay important and relevant because they move through many different kinds of contexts and reception histories. 
we turned to talking a little bit about the author function, which is important because a lot of discourse around Harry Potter has been to invoke the notion of the death of the author. Well, hand in hand with the death of the author is the notion of the author function, that the idea that a creator name has a meaning that is sometimes completely disconnected from the flesh and blood person who's behind it. We could also think about this a little bit as the modern idea around branding, although I don't love that and I'm not sure that it entirely works, but I offer it as a possibility. And so one of the things that we were thinking about today was the ways in which, um, you know, con you know, these kinds of connotations come up. And I use the example of Jane Austen because I always do because I'm a Jane Austen scholar um, somehow, uh, which is to say we have all these kinds of cultural assumptions about what it means to be a Jane Austen thing. We market stuff using the name, the author function of Jane Austen, but we forget that a lot of the things that we think about when we think about Jane Austen, like that she's about wealth and gentility and classiness and sweetness and politeness obscures the fact that, first of all, the historical Jane Austen was a sassy bitch. Um, some of her letters that survived that weren't destroyed by her sister suggest that what was destroyed was even more salty. Um, and also, of course, her novels are social critiques. They are not actually that invested or that focused on um, the extremely 1%. She is, of course, very solidly um, thinking about the gentry class and the, what we might think of as the kind of upwardly mobile middle class. Um, but she has kind of no real understanding of the mega wealthy. She, uh, And that's beyond the scope of this particular recap um, or even class today. But my point here is that the Jane Austen of her that, that created the works, the historical person, has largely been effaced, and even her works have largely been effaced in favor of the Jane Austen brand. Which is why I had students on the very first day hear the phrase Jane Austen RPG in relationship to good society, get really excited, and that meant different things for them you know, depending on the expectations that they brought in with them, which is fascinating and interesting and the nature of kind of cultural works to change over time. This is also true of, you know, the connotations around J.K. Rowling um, and her author function, as well as Harry Potter's own kind of what we might think of as textual function or branding or what have you. And so uh, everyone was coming in with kind of expectations about what Harry Potter was and Misfits and Magic engages with that and thinks about that and parodies it, um, explodes some of it, uh, reveals some of the kind of internal assumptions about it, and also uses some of the kind of apparatus of, uh, you know, the Potter world to tackle things that would otherwise be really challenging to tackle. For example, um, muggle isn't actually a slur in our world, um, but treating it as one in the world of misfits and magic allows for some transformative play and some, some critique play, uh, thinking about you know, language and, and its uses. We had a really good kind of initial discussion around Misfits and Magic, and I think several students are going to dive further into the rest of Misfits and Magic. We were also helped enormously by the fact that uh, Misfits and Magic in particular, and a lot of Dimension 20 shows in general, talk explicitly about the the nature of their making and development. Orion Black has been interviewed and has um, some great documentation around Misfits and Magic, and that's incredibly useful. So for those of us who are thinking as teachers about which actual plays we want to teach, it's not always necessarily the ones that are are the closest to our hearts necessarily, although this one I think is 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 one that means something to me and obviously it means something to Orion which is one of the reasons why they've talked about it so much uh, which is really valuable um, but of course 
we have all these kinds of constraints that we have to think about when we assign especially long works. What's helpful about Misfits and Magic is it's an edited actual play, so it's um, of a particular duration, and it ties into existing cultural works that my students are currently familiar with. I had seen it, um, they've, uh, uh, but really the kind of deciding factor at the end of the day was the amount of documentation. So, so kudos and many thanks um, to Orion Black for all of the kind of discourse that you've put out. Um, it is has not gone unnoticed uh, and is greatly appreciated. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and so it was nice to kind of have this be one of our initial uh, full length touchstones. It's important to remember for those of you who are new to the channel, uh, for those of you who are new to these campaign diaries, that of course students got a taste of actual play and what actual play is really early on in the semester because the second week of class was my birthday and so we read some of my work and as well as Matt Coville's work on another actual play, Critical Role, and specifically the, the end of campaign one. And so thinking about what actual plays are and how they function and writing about them is something that students have known about in that way. And also students have already started taking on as their, you know, kind of weekly tasks, watching other actual plays. Uh, and so, you know, that's in the mix as well. But this is the first time we've kind of talked about it um, specifically. We will talk about uh, a unedited for time, uh, although also pre-recorded thanks to the pandemic, um, a Brian Iyengar led um, actual play on Thursday when we explore Exandria Unlimited, uh, specifically episode four, By the Road. Um, and I've talked about this before, but just to kind of remind you, the reason why we're looking at By the Road and not say episode one, like we did today with uh, Misfits and Magic is because I think it works really nicely as a bottle episode. It is focused on By Rodin, and By Rodin is, uh, has had its lore enriched by Abria and by Amy Carrero by thinking about it as heavily resonant with um, Laredo, Texas, which is part of a larger project of a lot of Southern context and knowledge being included in particular in Exandria Unlimited in ways that, as I've said before, I don't think Critical Role has really done before, even though there are other permanent members of the cast who are also from the U.S. South. So, but that's Thursday and beyond. Um, so the other thing that we talked about today was the kind of experience of watching an actual play. And this is when I say to my students who are who are coming, who were not able to come to class, but also reiterating for everybody else, I feel very strongly that while there's a bunch of the apparatus of this class, we, we have things, we, all of our readings and viewing things are, are linked um, in perusal, which allows for the annotation of video and text and audio content. And that's really great. But what that can lead to is a kind of artificiality of experience, right? That uh, we've got a lot of attention. And one of the things I've noticed about actual play, at least from my experience as a watcher of actual play, is actual play's actual, actual attention kind of goes back and forth. Actual plays are so long and often turned into podcasts that they're they're a kind of media that are often consumed while doing something else. And I don't think that's a bad thing. As an 18th centuryist, that's kind of my home turf because 18th century novels were, you know, sometime consumed by people alone in their closet, which is really just like their tiny office um, reading silently to themselves. But a lot more of them were consumed with one person reading in a room full of other people who might have been doing embroidery or um, doing other kinds of activities, maybe playing cards, um, you know, maybe playing the piano, any number of other kinds of ways of, you know, kind of multitasking, what we might call today. Uh, books were luxury objects. And so 
it's not everyone had their own copy of Pamela, right? We have all of these documented accounts in the 18th century of communal reading practices. So when I teach the 18th century novel class, I say, here, here's the best available audiobooks. I want you to have a print copy so that you can do other kinds of close examination of text. But if your first experience is an auditory one, you're having an 18th century experience. In the same way today I said to students, you know, if we're gonna include a lot more actual plays, that's a lot of time. And it's okay that, you know, you might be on the treadmill, you might be walking outside with your dog, you might be doing laundry, you might be cooking dinner, that's okay. Um, you have permission. And what I love about and am fascinated by about actual plays as a form is the fact that you have a live experience for many. You have the video on demand experience also experienced by many. But for many, many of these actual plays, the podcast experience is also one that is robustly experienced. I used the example today of the Black Dice Society, which for me, I have found after watching it, after watching it video in demand, and after listening to it as podcast, that I find it most resonant and it works for me most effectively in its audio only form. I'm, you know, I still see snippets of it to kind of see the amazing kind of, you know, costuming choices of the cast makes in the in the VOD but I find it touches me most closely when it's a voice in my ear and I am able to pay, actually pay more attention in that way. I don't know what that says. I think it's an interesting research question to pursue. So that's one of the things that I've kind of given students the kind of permission to figure out the way to enjoy because I think that at the end of the day that's like what I'm here for. I want a new forms of pleasure and thinking and feeling to inform what we're doing. Coming up very soon, and so for my students who are uh, kind of missing class and coming back or who are participating this week virtually for whatever reason, um, please pay attention to the week six through 15 tab where there's a link to the wish list. And the wish list is simply stars and wishes. We've made a collective list of possibilities for ideas and texts and viewing experiences and also and ideas that we could pursue moving forward. Um, we could try a multi-day campaign. We could watch a live one live stream over an extended period of time. We could watch several more individual episodes to compare. We could try our hand at designing something. We could create a digital resource. We desperately need the t tabletop role-playing version of IMDB. Maybe we could get it started. Um, but also we have some possibilities from the fact that I am editing a special issue of Post 45 Contemporaries about tabletop role-playing games and long form media today. I have a whole bunch of pitches that have come in and one possibility is for the class to kind of serve as apprentice editors looking over those pitches with me and thinking about you know what are the continuities what are the ones that seem strong why is that you know how do these kinds of decisions get made so that's a possibility next week is more set in stone than i anticipated um on this Thursday, we're gonna decide what to watch um, or think about for Tuesday. But Thursday, we have a very special guest. It seems only fitting uh, to have Abria who, Iyengar, who has very kindly in, invited herself to class uh, to come and talk to us next Thursday. So we'll be looking at um, some more material from the Iyengar extended universe of uh, role-playing in preparation for that. Uh, so students have already been instructed that this is a rare and very special opportunity um, to ask questions of someone who has done a whole lot in this space in a lot and we a lot of different hats. And so we're just over the moon. This is, I last night was doing a little dance in this room. I will not replicate it for this video, but you can, it's not, it wouldn't be cute, but it would be very, very, it would be Kermit flail. 
very Kermit flail. Um, so we're, we're really thrilled. And in fact, the last uh, 12 minutes of class today, student raised their hand and was like, Dr. Freeman, how did this happen? Could you tell us how this happened? And I was like, sometimes Twitter works. And but and I think, you know, and I've talked elsewhere, um, you know, in these campaign diaries, but and I'll talk about it here a little bit. Um, you know, it's it's a funny thing, um, the way that Twitter communities form and the ways contacts get made and um who's visible in what spaces and the way that my visibility has uh, kind of changed over the last year, uh, which is really, really fascinating. And someone uh, posted earlier today on Twitter, like asking, like, you know, how has Twitter, um, you know, enhanced your experience or your teaching or, or what have you. And all I had to say was, Twitter has made this class and YouTube and kind of publicly talking about this class has made it so much better. It's been so wonderful to hear from people who are teaching role-playing game classes or who are trying to figure out how to add role-playing games to their classes. It's been so exciting to talk to, to game designers of games that we're, we're playing um, and games that are upcoming. Uh, it's one of the exciting things about the next couple of weeks is we have the opportunity to add in more uh, kind of designer voices, more visits like this. Um, I'm doing uh, some guest talks, talks uh, both this semester and in, you know, later semesters, uh, thinking about everything from Dragons and Critical Role, which is a guest lecture I'm giving in November, uh, to issues around fan fiction and, and what have you. Um, the this week the tabletop role playing game community has been showing some of its ass um so i don't want to be sunshine and lollipops and as i tell my students it's not all hearts and rainbows we've had conversations about uh, the nature of backlash and you know any human community is going to be kind of fraught in one way or another but i feel remarkably grateful for these particular kinds of moments where i see just you know, some wonderful generosity. Generosity that I'm going to need to figure out how to repay. Uh, so yeah, so that's the start of actual play week or our first week of Abria. Um, it's been super fun so far. Um, we'll be talking about the distinction uh, between editing something down for time versus the kind of full length, um, largely unedited experience on Thursday as one of our touchstone points, as well as kind of starting that conversation around uh, the use of Southern identity among my largely Southern students at this Southern university uh, in a role-playing game that is set in a fantasy world. Uh, those are kind of my two initial places I'm going to hang my hat on Thursday, it's highly likely it will go in weird and wonderful directions, which is kind of what I love about a discussion course where we bring our both our knowledge and our curiosities together and amazing alchemy happens. So it's not yet Thursday. It's going to be. It's going to be great. Thanks for watching. And of course, if you're my student, you have access to me on Discord. You have access to me on email. I am so glad to see you always. And I hope that you stay healthy and safe. If you are watching this because you are a friend of the class, uh, you can always put a comment down below or you can tweet at me at Fried, F-R-I-E-D-E. -E. It's the German word for peace. That's the first part of my name. Uh, so with that, See you Thursday.